I was recently reminded of YouTuber Lily Orchard's slightly infamous 100 tweet thread of writing tips from a couple years ago, so I went and revisited it. And boy do I have a lot to say. There are already quite a few responses online, but I haven't really seen any hit that holy trinity of concise, comprehensive, and correct. But more than that, even as I disagree with a lot of the points in the thread, I see where they're coming from, and a lot of them seem to reflect misconceptions and pitfalls that come up frequently in certain internet spaces, some of which I've been guilty of in the past too. So I'm making my own response. Disclaimer, I don't know much or anything about Lily Orchard as a person, so I'm gonna give her the benefit of the doubt going into this and extend good faith. My responses are entirely based on the content of the thread, not on anything else she's said and done. However strongly I might disagree with her, I do not not condone harassment or anything like that. With a follower base as huge as mine, something like that is a real risk. I just want to get my position out front and center. However tongue-in-cheek I might be in my responses, I hope it's evident that I don't intend any of this to be malicious. This is not an effort to bully anyone, it's not me starting beef, it's just me weighing in on something. And I'm not going to go into these just being contrarian and disagreeing unilaterally, I have actually thought about each one of them. That out of the way, let me share my findings. Don't worry about spoilers. If your story is good, spoilers aren't going to make it any less enjoyable. If spoilers make a story less enjoyable, then that just means you are relying on cheap shock value as a shortcut. Semi-agreeable, journey over destination, a lot of plot twists are clumsy and cheap, but you know, this doesn't really have anything to do with writing. The middle point of a story is the best time to get a main couple together. Are you working on a five season show? Put your main couple together halfway through season three. The finale is the worst time because we don't get any time to enjoy the payoff. This kind of presumes that a fictional couple's only function is to gratify the viewer. What about when relationships are not about payoff? Friends to lovers is greater than enemies to lovers every time. Not mutually exclusive, also a sweeping statement that conflates preference with objective quality. Victims of abuse moving away from the negative impacts of their abuse, i.e. Zuko, and becoming healthier are not redemption arcs. I mean, I feel the need to say this. Zuko was a villain. He did actively try to harm the good guys. Then he stopped being a villain, which I think most would call redemption. This point reflects a belief that people who have been abused are just not capable of wrongdoing or are never responsible for their actions. There are a lot of good stories in the world about cycles of trauma and the way that abuse can shape someone. Also, this isn't about writing, it's about talking about writing. Heroes refusing to kill villains who have shown to be actively trying to murder people isn't noble. It's enabling. You're right, every hero should just advocate the death penalty. All fictional heroes should be extensions of a police state panopticon. This is actually a really common point I've seen a lot. It's this binarist understanding of morality where wrongdoers just lose their right to exist. And suppose it is ignoble for heroes to be judge, jury, and executioner. Do we want heroes that are free of character flaws? Two women kissing in the last episode of a show after four to five seasons of trying to murder each other isn't revolutionary, it's fetishized abuse and violence. Not really what fetishized means, but I feel like I can't blame one person when like literally nobody uses that word correctly. To fetishize something is to give it power, to elevate it beyond its ordinary materiality, as in a spiritual or religious fetish. Everyone on the internet though just associates it with sexual fetishes and uses fetishize to mean sexualize or sexually degrade or make a sexual fetish out of something. Anyway, to actually address the point, this is so specific. Is this about like She-Ra or something? What I'm getting here is it's immoral to depict unhealthy relationships or to have characters be redeemed. We're at number six and we're already repeating ourselves. Twitter is not an appropriate place to reveal story details. The appropriate place is in the work itself. I actually agree with this one, I hate it when that happens. But this isn't writing advice, it's advice for writers. When a character's body count is over 10,000 innocent lives, then that character is no longer redeemable. Interesting wording. Is it heroic to kill 10,000 non-innocent people? It's the same point again. Sinners should wear a scarlet letter forever. At the end of the day, the worst person you can imagine realizing the error of their ways is an escapist fantasy though, and I don't really mind that. Tip 8 does not apply to characters for whom making them the villain was a stupid, idiotic idea, i.e. Sylvanas Windrunner. At that point, it's just character re -railment. Who the hell is Sylvanas Windrunner? 
Is that like a WoWcraft thing or Warhammer or something? This is just pulling a no true Scotsman on point eight to say, well, it doesn't apply to my fave though. How would one absorb this as advice? If I'm a writer, should I say, oh yeah, this totally applies to that character I wrote in a stupid idiotic way. Everything in a story is there because the creator wished it to be there. Okay, semi agree. I think it's true from a perspective of critique that you can say you didn't like the author's decision to do something or that something is reflective of harmful ideas on the author's part. That said, I've observed that sometimes discussions of authorial intent interfere with the transformative power of consumption and the ability to see the forest for the trees, as it were? The question that comes to me is, what qualifies as a bigoted story decision? Also at this point, I'm thinking I'm just gonna make the indigo certified seal of not a writing tip. Don't pair adults with minors. That's pedophilia. What about narratives about people being victimized by pedophilia? Should abuse just never be depicted even in telling stories about abuse and trauma? Plus the general conflation of writing an immoral action with doing an immoral action and the return of all fiction relationships are written to be gratifying. Don't sexualize teenage characters. Kind of agreeable, but there is a difference between sexually exploitative content and content that just doesn't shy away from the fact that teenagers know what sex is. Don't make up weird anime excuses for sexualizing teenage characters, actually a thousand, fusion, age of consent, etc. Okay, yeah, if a character looks nine, but the story's like, oh, she's actually 3000, so she can totally wear this horrible outfit, it skews me out, I don't like seeing it. Making a metaphor for gay trans ace rep is always inherently inferior to just making a gay trans ace character. Why can't can't LGBT motifs and ideas just be present in a narrative? Metaphor can be used to explore so many human experiences, and I think locking LGBT narratives out of that does more harm than good. If there are humans in your story, restricting gay trans ace ref to the non-human characters makes you a huge turd. Uh, that doesn't come across as a super mature way to talk about social issues. Anyway, this is hyper specific. How often does this come up? If the only gay man in your work is a faupish diva, you're a huge turd, what qualifies as a foppish diva? At what point are you resisting a stereotype and at what point are you seeing a gay man who is effeminate and problematizing it? At what point are you having a negative reaction to seeing a feminine man and trying to rationalize that in progressive terms? If the only lesbian in your work is an abusive rageaholic with vague angst issues and a codependent relationship to a protagonist, you're a huge turd. I've never watched She-Ra, but I'll bet my crest thing that this is about She-Ra. If it's not actively perpetuating homophobia, I'm struggling to see the issue with writing a lesbian character who is immoral or unhealthy. Why are we looking at LGBT characters and evaluating whether they're ethically upstanding before we evaluate whether they're deep, fully realized characters? If your only non-binary character is a non-human shapeshifter, you're a huge turd. Hyper-specific again, if you can conjure five notable examples of this from the last five years within five minutes, I'll accept that this is a real phenomenon. If your only autistic character is an ethically challenged number fetishist, you're a huge turd. I can accept this more so. If your only black character is a volatile, hyper-angry brute, you're a huge turd. Also a fair point, you'd get more mileage by making one point for just don't rely on degrading stereotypes though. If the only black woman in your cast barely gets any screen time except to be fetishized or fits rule 20, you're a huge turd. Once again, I hope you mean it's bad to frame the character as a sex object rather than that you think it's bad for black women to have any amount of sexual expression. If the only trans woman in your cast is a drag queen in all but name, you're a huge turd. Once again, don't do stereotypes. If you force a woman to kiss her own abuser, you're a huge turd. The wording here. Not writing a character to do something, but forcing a person to do something is extremely telling. This is just saying yet again that it's immoral for bad things to happen to fictional characters. If you sideline every non-white character in your cast to focus on a white boy with anger issues and a tendency toward hostility getting a redemption arc, you're a huge turd. These are getting so specific, the next point is gonna be like, if you write a round scientist who tries to steal the chaos emeralds, you're a huge turd. I agree, I don't like it when characters of color are sidelined for the benefit of white characters. The wording also kind of implies that anger and hostility should be unforgivable sins. Two in one. Justifying horny armor designs or horny clothing designs with sexual agency makes you a huge turd. Characters don't have sexual agency, you made them that way as a justification. If your justification is just to be honest and say you like ogling sexy characters, you're still a huge turd, but slightly less of a turd than the above. Slightly. 
While I have made fun of some of the justifications for getting characters naked before, the most vivid picture here is painted in unspoken words. Not designs that are degrading or objectifying, just designs that are horny or sexy. Is it immoral just for a character to be attractive? Is it immoral to want to see people you find attractive? Because whether that's what's meant here or not, that is the meaning in these words. For several points in a row now, the focus has been not so much on writing as on moral posturing. Don't worry about not having everything planned out beforehand. No writer or creator plans everything beforehand, and the ones who say they do are filthy liars. Writers have at best one to two story beats they're determined to include. Everything else is by the seat of their pants. No writer plans things in advance? Not one? I can't picture getting anything done without some kind of framework. How do you foreshadow, set up mysteries, set up character development without a plan? To each their own, I'm sure playing it by ear works for some people, but this conflates personal process with universal reality. Don't try and do what Avatar did. You can't. Even the people who made Avatar can't make another show do what Avatar did. I mean, sure, if you say, I'm gonna make the next Hamlet, you fail before you begin. Low stakes interpersonal conflict will always be more satisfying in the long run than high stakes saving the world. Friends is more popular than your favorite anime for a reason. Well, my favorite anime is a 13 episode art house movie, so maybe I can't talk. But like, you really think Friends is more profitable than Naruto? That aside, I do find interpersonal conflict more compelling a lot of the time, but that's a matter of opinion. Choose whether you're a comedy or a drama at the start and then stick to it. Don't start as a comedy, then become a drama later on. That just annoys people. Disagree, I think utilizing tone shifts is a sign of a good writer. I love The Order of the Stick and The Venture Brothers, both of which started as pastiche comedies before developing developing lore and plot and persisting conflict. I do think that failing to manage tone shifts can undercut a story. Like for me, the first chunk of Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood was impossible to get invested in because of the constant tonal whiplash, but it's not a bad thing for a series to evolve and come into its own. World building is like salt. A pinch can make it better, ten cups will not. I mean, it depends. Sometimes the story's about the lore. I do agree that sometimes overdeveloping the setting does leave the actual story in the dust. Characters should always come before anything else. This is just not true. Are you gonna look at Angel's Egg and Mulholland Drive and Cecilia Condi's entire filmography and tell me they're bad because they put concepts before characters? Also, if they're not allowed to develop and they're not allowed to suffer, what are the characters there for? The protagonist should be a protagonist, not just a vessel for the antagonist to hog the story. If you're gonna make a villain protagonist, just open with that. Some stories are cheapened by a lack of focus, but just as many stories benefit from distributing the narrative. Perspective shifts are a staple of storytelling. Having only one perspective isn't a stylistic choice, it's just crap. What about first-person stories that are about a single character's comprehension of what's around them? A stylistic choice doesn't cease to be a stylistic choice just because you think it's crap. If you're making a cartoon, hire writers. Don't just have your storyboarders write the story. That's not what they're there for. Okay, this is already jarring. Both that this is clearly targeted at some specific cartoon, and the notion that cartoon showrunners are looking for staffing advice in Twitter threads about writing tips which this one isn't, by the way. Artists draw, writers write, artists cannot just take over for the writers on a whim. Implying that no person can have two talents is so strange. Will They Won't They isn't a fun story, it's just addiction peddling. We need to stop pretending that Ross Rachel was good storytelling and learn to appreciate Chandler Monica and Joey Rachel. Again with friends, I don't know anything about these people, but I refuse to appreciate any of them in any combination. What the hell is addiction peddling and how does it correlate with sitcom romance subplots? Anyway, it's just another repeat. Romance trope but gay is not an absolute rule to live by. If Shira taught us anything, it's that gay Raylo was not actually an improvement. Shira has taught me nothing, but I am extremely curious about this. What could that show have possibly done to be called Gay Raylo? I won't accept it unless those characters also turn out to be cousins. Anyway, I kind of feel that gay storytelling needs to occupy the same spaces as straight storytelling, including being open to the same potential missteps. Like for example, Love, Simon demonstrated to the world that even a gay movie can be completely devoid of substance. Someone on this hell site, wild that we're now calling Twitter a hell site, that's a Tumblr thing. Like yes, Twitter is significantly more hellish than Tumblr, but it's still not as hellish as TikTok. Someone on this hell site once made the remark, we need more lesbian non-con because purity is boring. For those that don't know, non-con means non-consensual, in other words, stories usually fanfic about sexual assault. That is a dangerous, violent person. Do not listen to them, they do not have a point. Seriously, my fucking god, what is wrong with you people? I've already said bad things can happen 
happen in stories. It's not healthy to romanticize things like sexual assault, but the presence of that subject matter is not inherently romanticizing it. Very telling to just quote some random person and then call them dangerous and violent for what they want in a story. The next one is a lot. Women who fetishize abuse, Raylos, Cachadoras, Kigos, etc. What the hell is Kigo? Kid Goku? and present it as something feminist and paint detractors as misogynists are gaslighting you. I am so sick of the way gaslighting gets thrown around. It's a literal abuse tactic characterized by continual and deliberate deception to wear down the victim's sense of reality. It's not when someone lies to you or disagrees with you, or even when someone tells you they don't believe what you say. A random one-off interaction with a person on the internet literally cannot be gaslighting. Anyway, I have no experience with two of these ships and talking about about Raylo is like opening the window in a snowstorm, but regardless of your stance on this issue, not a writing tip. If abuse fetishists are giving you shit for not caving to their demands, just block them. Don't argue with them, don't debate them, don't treat them with good faith, just block them and get on with your day. Again with fetishists, the language frames anyone who disagrees as a sexual deviant. It's not a bad thing to use the block button, especially if you're being harassed. Likewise, authors should be able to parse between helpful and unhelpful commentary. But isn't it hypocritical to say this when most of the points so far have been written like demands? Also. Not a writing tip. Sexual assault victims are not villains and should never be written as villains. Don't be like Blizzard, it costs zero dollars to not be a misogynistic pig. This is just a rephrasing of the abuse point from earlier. There is something to be said for the phenomenon of female villains whose entire motivation is, oh she's sexually traumatized and now she's evil, but I don't like essentialist statements that traumatized people can do no wrong and that there can't be a nuanced story about a trauma survivor with complex morality. If straight men really hate a certain character but lesbians love them, there's a 90% chance that is your best character. Okay, this one's amusing, like I do love hearing my lesbian friends' takes. I can't tell if this is meant to be taken seriously, but if so, not writing advice. Neither straight men nor lesbians are monolithic, and even if they were, I don't know how you would take this into account while writing. A survey? <laughs> If one of your writers believes Simon Infinity Train was misunderstood and Grace is a villain, that writer should be fired immediately. I'd love to comment on this, but none of these words mean anything to me. The best solution to a love triangle is polyamory. You think the Twilight Trio would work as a thruple? If you have a male character who actually shows respect and admiration to a woman and some of your viewers call that character a simp, there's a 90% chance you have a good character. Uh, there's a 90% chance you have a character who is a good person, not the same as a good Good character. Also, not a writing tip. Mary Sue is not a real criticism. It's thinly veiled misogyny. Always disregard it. I mean, maybe I'm just saying this because three quarters of the characters I'd call Mary Sue's are men, but I don't find hyper-competent, flawless characters who never make mistakes compelling at all. Batman is only interesting if he's fallible. Also, not really a writing tip. Emotional vulnerability does not make a female character anti-feminist. This is true. And not a writing tip. Goblins are inherently anti-Semitic. There is an entire debate about this, and to compress that into a four-word axiom just disregards the complexity of it. There are fictional goblins that lean into anti-Semitic stereotype and caricature 100%, but, and I realize this is a weird sentence, goblins are versatile and complex. To suggest that a catch-all term for a hundred age-old folkloric monsters from different cultures is inherently anti-Semitic is to imply that bigotry is not about real, tangible circumstances, but metaphysical power that is attached to certain words and ideas. And you know what that's doing? It's fetishizing. If your first thought when told about a bigoted trope, barrier gaze, goblins, etc., is to try and figure out how to do it well, you are a huge turd who is missing the point. First, do goblins count as a trope? Second, I hate the mainstreaming of barrier gaze as a term. Like, I don't want to legitimize TV tropes as a cultural arbitrator. But third, it's one thing to discuss the commonality of LGBT characters suffering more than their straight cis counterparts. It's another thing to act like it's problematic for a story to depict anything bad happening to a gay person. It's not that these tropes aren't done well, it's that they're done too much. That's kind of sidestepping the point. If you do a bad trope well, you're not doing the bad trope anymore. Writing a relationship based on a dynamic or trying to get a particular trope like enemies to lovers into the story is a bad decision. I kind of agree with this one. Do you? 
Vitriol does not immediately render criticism invalid. If you tone police criticism, you will likely miss something important. The millionth non-writing tip and the billionth misused term. Tone policing is a diversionary tactic where you try to discredit someone's argument by characterizing them as too emotionally invested. It's not being upset that someone's erupting at you. Sending someone vitriol over the content of a children's cartoon is not normal, and they'd have the right to feel hurt by it. Writing something is not a contract to lie down and let yourself be trampled. You should not have to sift through verbal abuse for pearls of wisdom. Multiple items have invoked weighty terminology. Gaslighting, a violent and dangerous person, disproportionately serious accusations designed to paint those who disagree with you in the worst possible light, while also condemning others for doing exactly that. There's also an effort to validate rage. There's a recurring notion that revenge is the only acceptable ill, that the only valid murder is a revenge killing, a punitive execution. Just something I find interesting. Your fandom will fight an argument. You. This is how people solve conflicts. It's typically better to just let people fight it out than to be complacent and beg people to just stop fighting. Intervening is being complacent while sitting on the sidelines isn't. Right. Even though it's not a writing tip, this point totally works. Disagreements on the internet are generally benign, kind-hearted, and conducted in good faith, right? Every headcanon is valid should never leave your mouth. Do you want pedophiles and fascists in your fanbase? Because that's how you get pedophiles and fascists in your fanbase. Are writers responsible for the composition of their fanbase? Before asking how can I make something people will like, should artists ask themselves how can I make something bad people won't like? Also not writing. Speaking out against abuse fetishists, pedophiles, and bigots in your fanbase will always be better in the long run than being quiet or complacent. It might be exhausting to deal with, but it's better for everyone in the long run. I thought writers weren't supposed to intervene in conflict. So assuming we're talking about actually harmful people and not whatever people Lily happens to condemn, what are writers supposed to do? Swing at a hornet's nest? Expose themselves to verbal abuse? Oh right, they are supposed to do that. Oh yeah, not a writing tip. Fan service is a concept you should never think about. Fans who need to be serviced are not actually fans. If you have fans, those fans are already having fun and don't need to be pandered to. I'm assuming we're using the non-sexy description of fan service, like how a Kirby game can have fan service. So it's bad to do things that you expect will make your consumer happy. And just to read between the lines a little, a story going in a direction you don't like isn't always because the writer kowtowed to the evil fans. The tendency for shipping to dominate discourse is the biggest sign that characters and their relationships are more satisfying than anything else. People didn't petition for a fourth season of Kim Possible to see what happened with Draken or to see new villains. Um, I don't really have a finger on the pulse of the Kim Possible fanthropology, but shipping can dominate any discourse. The next three are connected. Complaints about too much negativity is shooting the messenger. If there's an overabundance of negativity, that means there's things to be negative about. People cannot be positive without things to be positive about. Well, I mean, if a person sets out to find negativity, they will always be able to. If you do something bigoted and get yelled at for it, listen to the people yelling at you. Cancel culture isn't real. The rage and vitriol will be gone in two weeks, and you'll be a better person for it. Quote unquote, cancel culture is difficult to address because it can mean a dozen different things. Getting yelled at stopped being the end of the world at age 10. It's disingenuous to say that the worst thing that'll happen to you on social media is getting yelled at when people get threatened, sworn at, called slurs, suicide baited, and harassed to the point of literal trauma regularly. The quickest and easiest way to make yelling stop is to own up to the mistake. Don't make excuses, fix it, and never repeat it. So is yelling not the end of the world, or is yelling something you want to stop? Progressives are very forgiving if you give them results. Once again, progressives are not a monolith. You don't know that everyone is going to be forgiving. Stubbornness is what gets people cancelled. Okay, people need time to absorb new information. If you go into a disagreement shouting and swearing, the other person is much more likely to dig their heels in. What these tweets are really saying is you should just allow anyone to shout and swear at you. You should make no effort to defend yourself because if anyone has deemed it right to shout and swear at you, they must be correct. And if you don't bow your head and take it, you're a bad person and will thus be subjected to something even worse. This is asking for an inhuman level of patience. How do you rationalize this with not caving to demands, and fans who need to be serviced are not fans, and always disregard criticisms that are not real. Oh, oh, before I forget, not writing tips. Forced diversity is a right-wing dog whistle, not a criticism. I mean, yeah. 
Not a writing tip, though. Reclaimed slurs are not universal and as such should never be included in a work. Once again, bad things are not allowed to happen in stories. Oppressed people fighting against their oppressors are not villains. No, I don't care if you think they went too far. Not all those who respond with violence are wrong, and not all those who preach nonviolence are right to do so. This is a two-tone understanding of the world. I think there's a place for moral complexity in fiction, and I once again find myself uncomfortable with the reification of righteous violence. A good spin on the heroes who never kill mantra is to highlight how refusing to kill a villain who later goes on to kill more innocent people makes the hero responsible for those deaths. There's a free story theme for ya. I mean, this is not a new concept. I recently vented about Halloween Kills going in this direction. Just like, why would it be so gratifying to see someone put in their place for not killing someone? If you're writing fantasy and you have no issue having dragons in your world but suddenly think people of color are unrealistic because something something medieval Europe, you're a huge turd and an idiot. That's agreeable. Sexual tension and chemistry are not the only indicators of a potential relationship, and in a relationship is the quickest thing to fade. There is a lot that has to go into a relationship, it does need to be more than just sex, but this take just reads like sex bad. The best potential romantic partner for a character is her best friend. They're best friends for a reason. Best friends are very frequently not romantically compatible. Maybe they're not dating for a reason. I don't want X character to be defined by her relationships is a stupid philosophy to have. Everyone is defined by their relationships. That's how human beings work. This is just not true. It's true that relationships are a major aspect of people, but characters shouldn't just exist as satellites or extensions of other characters. If you don't want a character to only be remembered for a romantic subplot, don't end the story on that subplot reaching it is conclusion. Give it time to sink in and become the new normal for the viewer. The memorable moment will always be the last moment. This is the same point from earlier. Slow burn does not mean taking forever to get together, it means full series-long romantic subplot. Getting together is the start of a romantic subplot, not the end. Still the same point? And not true at all, I don't know who would define slow burn this way. Sexual awakening is not a real character arc. Why not? The only people who think boob armor makes sense are people who have never touched a boob. Are we 12? The bow and arrow are strength weapons, not dexterity weapons. Female characters who do archery should naturally be very physically strong. Longbows have a draw weight of 80 to 150 pounds. Rangers are always stronger than warriors. Deal with it. Okay, this thread is getting incomprehensible. How are these tips being so repetitive, then neck snapping over to medieval fantasy logistics? The best way to avoid tokenism is multiple characters. This is a fair point, but also making a numbers game out of your cast's demography is not an adequate band-aid for potential issues. Want an easy way to become more accustomed to diverse casts? Limit your straight white cis characters to one of each. Those can be three characters for each trait, or pack it all into one character, but only one of each. That's kind of an interesting idea, but it's still a numbers game. Don't be afraid of failure and backlash. If someone is screaming at you about how a character you made is racist, that is literally free writing advice that someone is just giving you. Look on the bright side of life for a change. Yeah, if someone chops my head off, it's basically a free haircut. People of color and LGBTA people are allowed to just exist. Don't feel like you have to cover bigotry just because they're in the story. In fact, people will be happier if you don't, because having these characters defined by suffering is itself a tired trope. Acknowledging bigotry is not the same as defining characters by their suffering. Are minority writers not even allowed to discuss their own experiences? I just want my readers or viewers to have fun is an excellent attitude to have when it comes to storytelling. I mean, sure, but a lot of really great art has nothing to do with fun. As a general rule, Slice of Life has always been a more popular genre than action-adventure. Should writers only produce what's most popular, just make a smoothie of the most popular tropes? Then you end up with the MCU. Feature creep is a problem in storytelling as well. You don't have to cram every single idea, reference, and homage you can think of into a story. You can save ideas for another time. I agree, I do think lore can get out of hand easily. D&D alignments are terrible metrics for character design. Agreed. When writing LGBTA characters, stay as far away from Rocky Horror Picture Show as you possibly can. Okay, but like, who's using Rocky Horror as a point of reference? The q as a concept tactily reinforces heteronormativity by casting LGBTA people as inherently strange. In no big deal representation, the word should be avoided. Normalizing LGBTA people and the q are like oil and water and don't go together. Yo, let me be real. I can't bring myself to care about q discourse. Sexual assault is an unforgivable crime, more so than killing. Killing can potentially be justified in a story without becoming 
a villain, sexual assault cannot. I hate tactless depictions of sexual assault as much as the next guy, but I can't picture what writer needs to hear this. Sex scenes are never necessary. You want to include one because you're horny, more power to you, but any attempt to justify it as important to the story will only get you laughed at. I have seen sex scenes that are gratuitous and self-indulgent, god knows I have, but not all of them are, like watch The Green Knight and tell me that sex scene was in any way meant to be pleasing. Also, if you only write things that are necessary, you're gonna end up with a stack of blank paper. Strong characters can still cry and need support from others. Vulnerability is not a character flaw. While this is true, the assertion feels idealistic and ignores why a story might depict characters not crying or rejecting support. To bring up Full Metal Alchemist again, there is a persistent authorial voice in that series that feels so frustrated with men's inability to be vulnerable and deal with emotions. There's a major character who's so set on being stoic that he has to make feeble excuses to cry at his friend's funeral, and it feels pathetic and pitiable. It for forces you to contemplate the self-inflicted pain of emotional stagnation. What I'm saying is, vulnerability isn't a character flaw, but why are we talking like character flaws equal bad writing? Peak TV is a fancy way of saying addiction-fueled misery porn. 100% a repackaging of the cliché, plugged-in idea that all adult media is just sex and violence, only kids' shows are safe. You end up with this take if your only exposure to media for grown-ups is South Park and American Pie. And all that is a fancy way of saying, not a writing tip. Addiction-based storytelling relies on serialization, cliffhangers, shocking twists, constantly raised stakes, and an obsession with foreshadowing to get people to watch not because they're enjoying themselves, but because they're stuck on a tension high. By the end, the viewer is only watching for closure because they've already invested so much and need that fix in order to feel like it was worth it. This is the same business model soap operas use. Bizarrely fear-mongering, moral panicky way to talk about storytelling? You'd save a lot of words if you just said, no story should ever have conflict. If the sunk cost fallacy didn't exist, shows like Steven Universe and Game of Thrones would have been cancelled by season 2. What does Steven Universe have in common with Game of Thrones? Owens. Unable to conceptualize the idea that things you don't like are still liked by other people. Which fallacy needs to not exist for this to be a writing tip? Hardcore fans will tell you that continuity is the most important thing. They're wrong. I agree that a lot of accusations of plot holes are spurious, and I think minor contradictions for the sake of flow are forgivable. This is too political is a complaint only made by conservatives when a story acknowledges that non-white and non-straight people exist. The existence of other kinds of people is not political. Ignore these comments. Yeah, it definitely is a shallow right-wing argument that just complains about the existence of certain demographics in movies. I have seen stories try to tackle actual politics in shallow ways that end up diminishing them. The Little Mermaid and Cinderella are more feminist than Beauty and the Beast. Not a writing tip. More like a shitpost. Yeah, yeah, Belle has Stockholm Syndrome and Mario's addicted to shrooms. If you want to know when to change a trans character's pronouns in the narration, doing so at the moment they realize who they are and admit it to themselves out loud is chef's kiss. This one's perfectly fine. As long as it isn't harmful or bigoted, you don't have to justify story decisions made on the basis of self-indulgence. Synthesize this with some other points for a reaffirmation that the act of being horny is itself harmful. Anyway, this is too broad to be useful. Self-indulgence like fluff, or self-indulgence like making something that sucks? Vampires and werewolves are not inherently LGBT coded and doing so is an example of othering. Again, I think there should be space for exploring personal narratives through metaphor. They work better as metaphors for the aristocracy and predators respectively than as the underclass. So it's an issue to even make archetypal monsters not 100% evil? Those metaphors are valid, but they're not the only way to do things. I don't want to say too much more because monsters as metaphors is a subject I've wanted to cover since the dawn of this channel. Some of the best stories ever made were written as an act of Spite? What does this mean? Spite against what? This is not a writing tip. <laughs> Any system of government with the exception of fascism can exist in a positive or negative context. Monarchies are not always inherently evil, see Hawaii pre-annexation, and democracies are not always inherently good, see USA. Write accordingly. Okay, on one hand, the Hawaiian monarchy's history is way more complex than this, and there is a lot to be said for how easy it is to convince even progressives of the validity of hereditary monarchism. Like, does a monarch who is a good leader really mean that monarchism is a just system? 
system. And on the other hand, one could start asking whether representational democracy actually is democracy at all. But politics aside, what stories are characterizing monarchies as inherently evil? How many stories are out there saying the king's birthright is a bad thing? This is in the guise of a writing tip, but it's really just weighing in on political discourse. Lesbians still on good terms with ex-boyfriend from before coming out is a really cute friendship trope, and vice versa. Yeah. The only real difference between an extremely close platonic relationship and a romantic relationship is what the people involved choose to call it. Really. Is there not anything someone might expect from a romantic partner that they wouldn't expect from a friend? Is there not any behavior that feels more acceptable coming from one or the other? Best friends are not something that should ever be prefixed with the word just. This is just saying that all fiction and all characters should express the same values that you hold. Normalize friends saying I love you to each other. Okay, a pet peeve of mine is declarations of normalize X. Like, how? What do you want me to do? In what way is this not normal? I tell my friends I love them. This is not uncommon. This is just inventing a problem. If you write a hundred tweet long thread of writing advice, you are a huge loser with way too much free time on your hands. I can't talk. I'm the guy that did a response to a hundred tweet thread. Tips and rules are two different words. This is clearly a salty reply to people's reactions, but aren't you supposed to accept criticism? Listen to the negativity? But no, no, let's actually take this at face value. These are just tips, not rules. Nobody's saying you have to do them. So I did a little counting. Of the first 99 tips, there are 35 that either insult writers who do things a certain way or outright call them immoral. Of those 35, 14 specifically use the words a huge turd. Beyond that, another 14 state that certain works or qualities of works are objectively bad or are objectively worse than others, or will make your work less popular. A further 29 use absolutist language, always do this, never do that. That leaves us with 21 out of 99 that are not framed as rules. Among those 21, we have two that are impossible to apply in practice, four that are about fan engagement, two that are just baffling, and five things that no writer really needs to hear. <laughs> That leaves eight things that could actually be called writing tips, four of which I would call unambiguously bad. This list has fried my brain like a goddamn egg. At the end of the day, this list is a vessel for ranting. A lot of these points are vaguing about specific shows that have done things Lily didn't like. Beyond ranting, or rather in addition to ranting, this list is a way to flag moral superiority. A lot of very online, very plugged in takes. I've seen a lot of these takes before in the annals of internet discourse. It reflects a somewhat common attitude that the realm of fiction is the ultimate battleground of modern politics, that the state of progress or regression will be reflected principally in the bibliodrome, that you can determine determine the weight of social issues by inspecting the diversity of cartoons. And of course that attitude would emerge if we're conceptualizing fiction in terms of literal violence, literal addiction, literal abuse. In this mindscape, all real politics, the liberation of real people, the end of real oppression, none of this is as important as the virtuousness of fiction. And that virtuousness itself is shallowly defined by creating checklists and saying X is always evil, critical thinking is pushed to the wayside, why actually evaluate yourself for racism? or misogyny or homophobia or transphobia when you can regurgitate a set of flags to check for. It still gets worse though, the list straight up advocates against including anything that could potentially cause discomfort. Slice of life stories are unambiguously the best and stories shouldn't have stakes or conflict. Maybe everything should just be a fluffy fanfic that's 10,000 words of spooning. I went into this expecting a list of questionable writing tips, but I ended up reading a treatise for fiction to be a sanitized white room with padded walls where nobody ever suffers or has sex, to be stagnant with the tone never changing and the characters never developing. It's a call for all stories to play it safe forever. Part of why I'm so offset is it's not an isolated set of beliefs. Almost every take in here I have seen before on social media. Like I said earlier, I've fallen for a lot of them in the past, and when they're worded in a way that suggests that to even consider disagreeing makes you a bad person, what are you supposed to do? This approach encourages people to 
build their worldviews based on guilt and scruples. It saddens me to see how widespread these attitudes get, how takes that are ultimately reactionary can catch on in progressive circles, sweatered in progressive language. I don't hold any of this against Lily Orchard. If you've watched any video of mine, you know I'm a leftist, and I imagine Lily and I agree on more political issues than we disagree on. For all my ribbing and facetiousness, I just don't know enough about her to make a personal judgement. She made a series of statements, and I've made a series of responses. What I want is not to call anyone out or to shame anyone. I want more people, more circles, and more spaces to have room for valuing nuanced art, nuanced perspectives, and nuanced critique. I want to see the internet zeitgeist move away from seeing every issue as a light switch flipping between good and evil. I want to see more people writing, I want to see them be clumsy and make mistakes and grow as a result. I want to see messy art and challenging art and art that goes to difficult places. And I hope that doesn't make me a huge turd. Hey, thanks for watching. You can find me on Twitter if you want. You know, I feel inspired by all of this. Let me share the five greatest writing tips that Indigo could find. 1. As the writer, you are basically the god of all the characters you create. As such, you should never write characters feeling sad, because that is literally tormenting real people. 2. Writing under a pseudonym is literally catfishing. It's never acceptable. 3. Fiction should never involve sex. Depicting characters with sex lives basically makes you a porn writer and you do not deserve to live. 4. If the hero of your story sees a shoplifter and does not immediately torture them to death, you're literally condoning and fetishizing the sin of theft, which makes you a disgusting and violent person. I've already hacked your phone to get your location and I've deployed the drones. 5. If the only gay man in your story is a clarinet-playing cephalopod cashier, you're a huge turd.